it's Sunday night, and our subject has been for, I was counting, I think the uh, number of messages on the doctrine of the devil was about somewhere in the neighborhood of 250. So that'd be 250 Sunday nights we have been, or 250 weeks we've been teaching on the doctrine of the devil. And the reason we're teaching on this is because I believe the doctrine of the devil is running rampant through America. It's everywhere. And of course, the Bible speaks about that doctrine in 1 Timothy 4 and 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, and give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Well, that word devil, daemonion, is our word demon. And it means to distribute fortunes. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. And this is nothing but self. That's all it is. Demons are self. That's what they are. I told a waiter that today. Uh, I said, demons are nothing but self. That's all they are. I said, there's no such thing as demons. The Bible says so. Jesus uh, rebuked, when he rebuked the man in Mark, the first chapter, he rebuked him, A-U-T-O, and that's the word self. I keep saying an automobile is self-mobile, and auto is self, and that's what a demon actually is. Now, the people said there were demons came in all kinds of forms. They said that demons would make you fall on the ground and spit and carry on and have fits and fall in the fire. Well, that is called epilepsy. If a man had epilepsy, of course, they didn't have anybody diagnosing that. They would say he had a demon. Or if he, they would say a demon would get you a good job. Or a, 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 they would say a good demon would get you a good job and a bad demon would get you fired. They had good demons and bad demons. What? Oh, I thought you were inserting something there. Who? Socrates said he had a good demon. Really? <laughs> now that's amazing, isn't it? They even called Augustus Caesar a good demon or a good god. That's why when the rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, Good master. And Jesus said, Why callest thou me good? At that time, Augustus Caesar was the, was the Caesar ruling the world. And Jesus said, Why are you calling me good? There's none good but God. He was being facetious or sarcastic. He was saying, If I am good, I am God. Well, he was God, so therefore he was good. But he knew the young man's heart. He knew that he wasn't really believing that he was God. And he was saying to him, if I'm good, I'm God. And Jesus is God, therefore he's good. And at that time, if you called anyone God besides Caesar, that was a capital offense and you could die for it. So what Jesus was saying was a capital offense and he could have died other than the fact God is going to reserve him for the cross. Now, we're talking about the doctrine of demons. We said last Sunday night that what the devil's doctrine is, it distributes fortunes. It's a soft, easy word. It's easy. And Paul puts it this way. He says, Mark them which cause divisions and offenses that are contrary to the doctrines ye have learned, and avoid these doctrines, because they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ but their own belly, and by good words... Good words and fair speeches, easy-sounding speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple. So the doctrine of the devil is something that sounds good to the ear. It's not somebody uh, spewing fire out of their mouth and they got horns on their head. That's a fairy tale. Well, fairies are demons, aren't they? If you believe in demons, you have to believe in genies. You have to believe in fairies. You have to believe in totems because they're all one and the same thing in different cultures. Now, the doctrine of the devil is a smooth talk. And all it does is when the devil does something and he, he preached his doctrine for the first time in the garden, after God said, Thou shalt not eat of the tree, and the day you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. Satan's doctrine just simply took the word of God and twisted it, perverted it. That's what the doctrine of the devil is. You cannot seduce someone 
by going off to some, some teaching that has nothing to do with the Bible. When Jesus said, many will come in my name, and they'll say that I am Christ. They're not going to say they're Christ. You can't seduce that way. He said they'll even say I'm Christ, and they'll deceive many, and they'll have all the terminology. They'll have saved and baptized and salvation and pray and prayer, and they'll have all these words, but they'll mistranslate them, and they'll twist them. We're talking about that concerning what I'm going to go into tonight. The world has twisted the words of God, and that's what Satan did. He said to Eve, Thou shalt not surely die. God knows that the day that you eat thereof, you'll be as God's, and you'll know as much as he knows. He just doesn't want you to know how much he knows. Isn't that a ridiculous statement? It's ridiculous because why would God put a tree there so they could eat and get as smart as him? It's ridiculous. Well, it's the doctrine of Satan is ridiculous. We're talking about in the first century when Paul is preaching, when Jesus is birthed, Jesus is born in Bethlehem, and that's not Christmas, when he's born in Bethlehem, in Luke, the second chapter, and he's a young child in a house, in Matthew, the second chapter, he's a young child, he's not a babe, and when the, when the uh, wise men get there, he's in a house, he's a young child, at least two years old living in a house. When he's in the manger, in Luke 2, when he's in the manger, at this time, you had... Two religions in the world. Everybody in the world outside of Israel was preaching sun and tree worship. If you were up here at Corinth, they worshiped Venus. They had a thousand temple prostitutes to try to seduce men into the temple and become Venus worshipers. You had the temple of Aphrodite over at Ephesus on the western end of Turkey, but they called that Asia Minor, and they had a thousand temple prostitutes there. And they had all the world corrupted with sun and tree worship. At the time Jesus was born, Israel was teaching the Pharisees were in charge. Pharisees were in charge, and the Pharisees were not teaching the Old Testament. Absolutely were not. They were teaching a perverted form of the Old Testament, they were doing like everyone else is doing today in America. They were forward and they had twisted the word of God. That's what's going on in America. We talked about that this morning. Or they perverted the word of God. That's the Old Testament word means to pervert or twist or distort. They were teaching not the law of Moses. They were teaching the traditionary. law of Moses. That is the doctrine of the devil. The law of Moses, law of Moses, is something completely different. Now what we're going to do, we're going to look at this traditionary law of Moses. That's what was going on in the world. No one was telling the truth other than when God called John the Baptist to come and preach or unless you'd have someone like, like Simon when he saw Jesus in the temple in that first chapter of Luke, and he says, now, he says, I've been able to see the salvation of the Lord. Now all flesh will see the salvation of the Lord when Jesus was brought to the temple as a baby for Mary to offer the two turtle doves the sacrifice for a new baby born in Israel. At this time, other than some men that were out here on their own, there was no organized system telling truth. The Pharisees were in charge in Jerusalem. They were in charge of the temple and they were in charge of the synagogue. And what is the difference between the temple and the synagogue? The temple was ordained by God. The synagogue was a Babylonian, Babylonian worship system and that was organized by the Pharisees of old, when they were the rabbis 
of the Babylonian synagogue. The word rabbi means master or teacher. Master or teacher. Now, let's, let's go into how this came about, okay? Let me erase this. Here is where the Pharisees came from. The word Pharisee means pure one. It means they thought they were pure and they called themselves Pharisees. Now, we were talking about this morning that certain things resulted from Israel being carried away captive. Israel was a nation from 1 Samuel through 2 Chronicles. That's, that's why they were a kingdom. Well, I'm doing putting Christ. 2 Chronicles, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles. It starts with King Saul and then David and then Solomon and it goes on to Jeroboam of northern Israel, Rehoboam of southern Judah and it goes all the way out until 2 Chronicles, the 36th chapter. Northern Israel is carried away into captivity. They're carried away into captivity in 722 B.C. by the Assyrians. And then southern Judah is carried away into captivity in 586 B.C. Now we've said this morning that certain things came about through Israel's being carried captive. Now, one of the things that came about was the 70 weeks of Daniel, and we're going to be teaching on that on Sunday morning. 70 weeks. Another thing that came about was Christ's Mass. Christmas is the same system that Israel became involved in all the time they were a nation for 500 years, where they went after Baal and Grove, etc. Now, and then the third thing we said came about was tongues, or glossa and dialectos. We went through this this morning and last Sunday morning. Glossa and dialectos, or dialects. We've said that when they said, how here we ever man our own dialect of the Greek language in the country where we were born. That's what it's talking about. If you're watching and you want to get those DVDs, you can have those on tongues. And then, of course, the tongues came about because when they were scattered all over the world, they ceased to speak the Hebrew, and the rabbis in Babylon more or less deified the Hebrew language and made it a language for Hebrew scholars and doctors and scribes and Pharisees. They made that the Hebrew, and they quit speaking Hebrew, and a hundred years after they've been carried captive, they're all speaking... Uh, well, particularly in 539, Persia gets overthrown. Persia overthrows Babylon. And then Persia's overthrown around 332 by Alexander the Great. And he gives all the world its glossa, which is foreign language, and all of its dialects. Every time you find tongue, it'll be one of those words in the New Testament. Well, they're scattered all over the world. And what happens... One other thing particularly special happens. One other thing happens. And that is the synagogue. I want you to notice this. Due to Israel going after Baal, Grove, Shemash, Molech, and all these sun and tree goddesses, Israel was scattered. And what results from that is the synagogue, the rabbi worship, which becomes the Pharisees in the New Testament during Jesus' time. Now, how this comes about, they're carried away. Southern Judah's carried away in that 36th chapter of Second Chronicles and the 25th chapter of Second Kings, and they're carried over here into Babylon. I really want you to remember these things came about due to Israel being scattered. Well, Israel had become corrupted and twisted and froward in their, in their worship of God because they worshiped Baal and Grove and they wouldn't keep the sabbatical years and they wouldn't take care of the widow and the orphan, so they corrupted God's word. They get over here in Babylon and sometime during the second temple period, the first temple is Solomon's temple. Solomon's temple. That is the one that was built in 1 
Kings, starting in 4 and 5, where that Hiram is recruited to bring uh, cedars from down from Lebanon, and uh, which is just above Israel. It's actually uh, Tyre and Sidon. And so Israel is carried away into captivity. While they're in Babylon, they say we need a, a way of worship. The, during the second temple period, this one over here is destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. So they rebuild a temple. They, they're given decrees in 538 in 5 in B.C. and in 520 B.C. and in 5 and in 457 B.C. by Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes to go back and rebuild the temple. And they go back and rebuild the temple under Nehemiah in 444 B.C. Uh, excuse me, 444 B.C. is where they're given, Nehemiah's given the decree to rebuild the city that was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. And then during this temple period, which is these first three decrees, sometime during that period, the writers say the Babylonian synagogue, Babylonian synagogue is established. Synagogue comes from Sun and Ago. Ago means to lead. Sun means with. It means to gather together with or to assemble with. That's what synagogue means. Now, when they were over here, they said we need a law. Well, they, they set up rabbinical worship or rabbi rabbi worship and uh, or master worship. Not they didn't worship the rabbis, but they set up a worship that was instituted by the rabbis or the masters of Babylon. So they set up a synagogue over here and they say we need a law. So they took the law from Israel. And I put it this way. I say they bring it over here. Well, it was over here with them. But I say they bring the law over to Babylon and they translate it from the Hebrew Chaldee language. Chaldee is an Assyrian language and Chaldean is a form, it's a dialect of the Hebrew. Uh, <clears throat> from the Hebrew Chaldee language, and they translate it over to the Aramaic or the Eastern Aramaic in Babylon. The Western Aramaic was spoken over here in Syria. Even northern Israel had a form of an Aramaic. It was a Samaritan Aramaic, which was also a was also a uh, dialect of Hebrew. But just because you could speak Aramaic didn't mean you speak Hebrew because you couldn't. So they translated the law over here to Aramaic. That translation was called the Targum. The Targum. Now this is the res this carrying away, the result was what the Pharisees brought back to Jerusalem during the days of Jesus, during Jesus' day, they brought all of this construction of the Babylonian worship and they're, they're re restructuring the Word of God, which was the Hebrew Chaldean language of the law. And they said they had, when they brought the law over to Babylon, they said they had 613 laws. Now, if I counted the laws in the, uh, in the law, the Torah, the Pentateuch, first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, I would probably come up with more laws than that. But the way they counted them, they said six, 613 laws. So when they brought these laws over to Babylon, they translated it, and it was called the Targum. And what they did, they put their spin... You know what a spin is, don't you? A spin is an opinion. Whenever you watch Bill O'Reilly, he says, this is a no-spin zone, and it's a total spin. What an idiot. It's a Republican, a right-wing, radical spin off in right field somewhere. It's, that's what it is. And he says, a no-spin. Spin means to put your opinions on the facts. That's what it means. Change it according to your desires and what you want out of life. 
That's what the Pharisees did with the law, bringing it over here. They put their spin on the Targum as they translated it over into the Aramaic. Now, they had what they called, this came in, they didn't have, they didn't have priests like they had over here in Israel from the tribe of Levi, and they didn't have high priests that came out of the tribe of, that came out of Aaron's ancestry. They didn't have that, high priest and priest. What they had was a head rabbi or a, a chief rabbi of the great synagogue of Babylon. That's what they had. And he was in charge, in charge. And he had all of these rabbis under him. And they were actually taking the place of the high priest and the priests. All the high priests and the priests were all Levites, Jacob's third-born son. So they had the, they had the rabbis and the rabbis under the head rabbi. Now, what they did when they twisted this word of God, and this is what was going on during the days of Jesus, was this right here. They twisted it, and they came up with something they called their oral law. Now they said this oral law had been given to Moses on Mount Sinai. And they said in Babylon that this oral law took precedence over the written law that God had given Moses. They said that God appeared to Moses and gave him the oral law and it couldn't be written down. And Moses passed it on to Joshua and then Joshua passed it on to the priest and they passed it down from one generation to the next. And that in this oral law, they, had, they called this law, the oral law, they called it halakha. And it was a twisted form of God's true word, the law over here. It was a perverted form. Halakha. And they said this oral law could never be written down. It had to be spoken aloud. And in this oral law, the halakha, they said what they could do. They said the head rabbi... If he lived 50 years, all the time he was there, he could examine these 613 laws. And if the rabbi previous to him, the head or the chief rabbi of the Babylonian synagogue, the one prior to him, if this rabbi believed this rabbi didn't give a full explanation of, these, of any of these particular laws, he could merely add his opinion to the oral law the halakha. So, during the, during the second temple period, during this time period, somewhere in the neighborhood of 538 to, to 457 B.C., the synagogue starts in that time period. And this halakha and Haggadah begins, and they add to this all through the years. They have over 500 years of one rabbi after another. Now, can you imagine if you got a man that's a rabbi and he's not serious about God and he starts putting all kinds of opinions in that halakha, what you're going to end up with? It's the biggest mess in the world. So by the time you get down to Jesus, you got over 500 years of twisting the Word of God by these rabbis who had not repented of their son and tree worship over in Israel. Can you see that? You talk about corrupt. Then you had. They said this was their oral law, halakha. Now I've got books on this. I've got. I've got uh, this right here. Literature of the sages. A sage is a wise man of old. 
This is the sages is referring to the rabbis of the Babylonian synagogue. Now this is called the compendia. I've got about 11 different books in the compendia. They put one out about every two years. I've got volume one and volume two of the sages. And if you can't see this, I'll read it to you. Literature of the sages or literature of the Babylonian rabbis. Every synagogue in America does not follow the law of God. They follow the traditionary law of the rabbis of the Babylonian synagogue. Synagogue is Babylonian. They also said, besides, they also said that this law was given to Moses on Mount Sinai verbally. That's why Jesus said, you have heard that it hath been said by the Pharisees of old time. He's not referring to the Pharisees of the law during Israel. He's talking about the Pharisees over here. And then he would say, but I say, but I say. He said, they say. And he's saying, I didn't say that. And I didn't get the verbal law for, through, I did not give Moses the verbal law on the mount. He says, that's not true. Jesus starts his first message in his ministry in Matthew 5, contradicting this law of the Babylonian synagogue. That's what he starts off doing. And he ends his ministry contradicting it over there in the 23rd chapter of Matthew. I've got this book on literature of the sages. I've got volume 1 and volume 2. You'll notice here it says, first part, oral Torah. That doesn't mean the Torah. It means the oral Torah, which is a pollution of the Torah. Torah is the first five books of the Old Testament. That's what the Jews call it. We call it Pentateuch. Pentateuch means five books. Then it says Halakha, Mishnah, Tosefta means an addition. As they would go along and they wanted to add some of these things, they would say, we got another Tosefta, another addition. Talmud, external tractates. And when you go in here, it'll tell you a lot about it. Now, let me go ahead and... Now, here's what... Let me read something to you here. Some people will say, the Halakha didn't start until around 200 A.D. That's not true. It was in the making all these years. When Jesus said, you've heard it, it hath been said, that's proof it was in effect during his lifetime. And what he was doing, Jesus started his ministry correcting the only doctrine in the world that was supposed to be preaching the Word of God, and they were not. What they had done was polluted the Word of God. Now to show you, let me read something to you here. In this, this is an effort on the part of Christians and Jews to uh, show the relationship between Christianity and Judaism. And they started this series of books in 1964. And I've also have, I've mentioned to you in the compendia, this is Latin words, compendia, rerum, uh, Eudericum ad novum testamentum. Uh, it's Latin words, and they just usually go by compendia. You've heard me mention the compendia, the Jews in the first century, volumes, volumes one and two. This is another type of book in that compendia. Now he says here, let me read a little bit of this. The material evolving... The material evolving in this process was finally collated, which means in, it was brought together, ready for print, collated or edited by some sage in one or another house of study. Now, all of this came about over a long period of time. Some people try to say the halakha wasn't around in days, Jesus' day. Jesus said, you have heard that it hath been said. That's a reference to the oral law. In Babylon, that's not a reference. Why would Jesus correct the law? 
He wouldn't correct the law. Right before he said, you've heard it hath been said by them of old time, he's talking about the Pharisees, and he says right before that, I didn't come to destroy the law and the prophets. Why would he say, I didn't come to destroy the law and the prophets, and then speak against it? Huh? It's not what he's speaking against in Matthew 5. Well, look at that. I'll read you this in a minute. Look at Matthew 5. This is a reference to a lock-off. I want to explain a lot of this to you so you can see it. Matthew, the fifth chapter. Matthew 5. This is a reference to a law call. It's not a reference to the Old Testament. This halakha is translated, when you look up the word tradition in the New Testament, tradition. When Jesus tells the Pharisees, you make the word of God of none effect by your tradition, by your paradosis. When you look at the word paradosis, under the definition it says, traditionary law of Moses. He said you make the word of God of none effect by twisting it over here. Let me tell you, America's made the word of God of none effect in these churches by their twisting of the word of God. Like a sinner's prayer, accept Christ, Christ's mass. Saying prayer means to ask God for what you want and get it. No, prayer means to bow to the will of God. They made the word of God of none effect. None effect is the word A-K-U-R-O-O, -O, akarao. And none effect comes from the word kurios. Kurios is the word Lord. Placing the alpha in front of kurios translates, negates the word. It means no Lord. He says your traditionary law of the Babylonian synagogue has negated the word of God, which is the Old Testament law. And Jesus says here in Matthew, the fifth chapter, verse 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law and the prophets. If he says that, why is he going to talk against it later on? He's not. Jesus is not talking against the law. Paul said, do we make void the law through faith? Yea, we establish the law. All the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love, agape, thy neighbor as thyself. And agape is walking in the commandments of God or walking in the laws of God. The law is not done away with. Whoever come up with that, hasn't he written on fleshy tables of our hearts the law? Can you go out and kill somebody? Because the law is done away with. What about the Ten Commandments? Except the Ten Commandments. Ignorant? The law is now spiritual, isn't it? We're spiritual Israel, spiritual temples, spiritual priests and kings. Then he says, Verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot... A jot was a yod, the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and one tittle, that's the smallest markings on the Hebrew alphabet. One jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, because the law was written in Hebrew, and the yod was the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet, looked like this. That was a yod, and a tittle was like, and a tittle was a tit, smallest marking. If you take the tittle off of this letter here, you turn it into a K. This, with the tittle, it's a B. It's a Beth. One jot, one yard, one tittle will not pass from the law. So Jesus is saying, no part of the law is done away with. Didn't he, what, didn't he say that? And then he says, whosoever thou shall break one of these least commandments. What least commandments? The jots and the tittles. Changing God's word. He is attacking the Pharisees for translating the word of God over here to Babylon and twisting it. They're changing the jots and the tittles. They're changing more than that. They're twisting the word all to pieces. Then he says, And anybody who teaches men to change one, one jot, one tittle, the least part of God's law, he says, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of God, but whosoever shall do and teach them, they shame shall be great in the kingdom of God. For I say unto you, and then he tells you who changed the jots and the tittles. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees who are the rabbis of the Babylonian synagogue just hundreds of years before, he says, ye shall in no case 
no way, no, not at all, enter into the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about the scribes and Pharisees who have changed the laws, changed the jots and the tittles. And then he says, Ye have heard that was said by the scribes and Pharisees of old time. Now why would he start to recommend, reprimand the law over here when he just got through saying no part of this has passed away, not even a jot or a tittle? He wouldn't reprimand the law. He's reprimanding them for their ver You have heard that it had been said. That is an attack on the halakha. Oh yes, by the way, they had a Haggadah and that was the written commentary. Haggadah. And they said that law could not be spoken aloud. Haggadah. And the one that had the prominence was Halakha. And they just said it was more holy than the law given, the written law given to Moses on Sinai. And they said the synagogue of Babylon was more holy than the temple in Jerusalem. People will ask, well, what day of the week did they worship in the first century? They worshiped on Sunday, the first day of the week. Let everybody, 1 Corinthians 16 and 1, let everyone lay by in the store on the first day of the week as God has prostrated him. Acts 20 and 7, on the first day of the week, Paul preached. They gathered together on the first day of the week because that's the day that Jesus rose from the dead. Didn't Paul go to the synagogues? You bet your life he did. On Saturday, on the seventh day, what for? To attack the Pharisees' halakha. In fact, when he was taken at the end of the book of Acts, over in the 23rd, 24th chapter, the Pharisees are taking him and accusing him of trying to destroy the law of God. He wasn't trying to destroy the law of God. He was trying to destroy this. And he attacked them on every hand on it. So whenever he's saying here, you have heard that it hath been said, he's talking, and then he says, but I say, he's saying, I didn't say what they're saying over here in Babylon. I said this. He goes after him. Now, what people will say, they'll say, well, all this came about in 200 A.D., that not according to Jesus here, and not according to the researchers of Halakha and Haggadah. A lot of people try to say Jesus couldn't be talking about this because Halakha hadn't come into effect yet. Halakha was hundreds of years in developing. Hundreds of years. And the Talmud, which is a final, is the final redaction. R-E-D-A-C-T-I-O-N. Redaction is when something is ready for print. I thought I'd define that. Most people don't know that. The final redaction would be in Brown 200 A.D. for the Talmud. And the Talmud was a development through many stages of this Halakha and this Haggadah. It started a long time before this. Some say it started in Second Chronicles. The Pharisees would say it started in Second Chronicles and they would say this halakha started in Nehemiah, the 8th chapter. Because they would go out in public and they would, they would quote this verbal oral law and they would explain what it meant. Now I'll go into that in just a minute. Why they said it was in Nehemiah. Now, let me read this here to show you that the halakha was here during Jesus' day. It speaks of the halakha, or the oral law. Thus, a halakhic, and it's actually a l a k i c. There's no H's, and halakhic comes from halakha. No H's in the Greek alphabet. There is this breathing sound, which is a ha, an H sound. So they're saying, thus a halakhic, I'll bet you there's not a preacher in America preaching on this anywhere, anytime. How did I get interested in it? I'll tell you in a minute. 
Thus a halakhic or haggadic, A-G-G-A-D-I-C. It's got the H sound, the breathing sound. Or the haggadic tradition, tradition, tradition. A tradition is something that's passed down from one generation to the next with no foundation in its inception. No foundation. There is no foundation in the halakha or the gada. It's a twisting of the word of God. Just like the American preachers are twisting the word of God with Christmas. We got halakha alive and well. It simply passes from one generation to the next. And it goes all the way down to the time. It had many. It, at the start they call that in Second Chronicles. And in Nehemiah, they call this, they call this halakha, halakha. They call it the verbal law. Let me read this here. Thus, a halakhic or haggadic tradition found in a late collection, or even one with the explicit late attention, attribution, does not necessarily have a late origin. Because it developed over, these guys were adding their opinions over hundreds and hundreds of years, the head rabbi of the Babylonian synagogue. They're adding what, you had some real famous, two of the most famous of these men. One was Maimonides, M-A-I-O. Maimonides, N-E-D-E-S. Maimonides was one of the famous head rabbis of the Babylonian synagogue. When you're reading out of McClinic and Strong, it'll say R, period. Eliezer says so-and-so. That's what it's talking about. It's talking about their halakhic ideas. Then, let me read this. They say it's of a late collection, that it has to be of late origin. It may date to much earlier period or reflect a situation from that period. Sometimes... This can be proven through a comparison with early sources outside of Talmudic literature. Such a tradition preserved in a 1st and 2nd century source may then turn out to be the consummation of a religious idea or custom which had been developing for a long time and originated somewhere in the early Second Temple period. It originated some back here, somewhere back here in the Second Temple period. That's what they're saying here. And it grew into the Talmud. Now what's funny, what's comical to me, is the stages that it went through. First it was called the Midrash. And they said these verses over here in Second Chronicles... And particularly Nehemiah 8 was the Midrash. Then it developed on down through, uh, it has many terms. You went through the Mishnah stage. Mishnah, and I've got a Mishnah at home. That is a commentary on the Talmud. Then it went through, went through Halakha and Haggadah. And then eventually it ended up, what they said could not be could not be written down. What they said could not be spoken aloud. Somehow God changed his mind by about 200 A.D. and it all took the form of the Talmud. Now that's kind of funny, isn't it? It's like God changed his mind. You can write some of it down that you couldn't write down. Now you can speak the other aloud. You couldn't speak the, the, you couldn't speak the Haggadah out loud and you couldn't write down Halakha. And that's borne out in all these books. Let me give you another set of books. I'll tell you what got me interested in this. One of the most fantastic sets of commentaries I have ever seen. But you can't even begin to understand it unless you understand what's going on here. I had a lady who had a master's degree in in uh, English, and she tried. She got her set of these and just tried to read them without understanding this. She said, I don't understand those. Well, I, certainly you can't. You can't just read them and understand. I got 
This is a four-volume set. It's called Commentary on the New Testament from the Talmud and Hebraica. This was written by Lightfoot, and I didn't understand what it was about, and I began to study it, and he'll talk about halakhic, uh, oral law, all through here. And what he does, he takes Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. He can't comment on every one of the verses, but he studied his whole life to write this set of commentaries. And it's about Halak on Haggadah. And he takes off through Matthew. And he'll go through Matthew 5. He'll talk about them saying, you've heard it, it hath been said, but I say. Most people that I've talked to, they say, I thought when Jesus said, but I say, he's referencing over here in the law. Why would he reference the law to correct it when he said no part of it will be destroyed? You understand what I'm saying? No part's going to be destroyed. He's not correcting the law. He's correcting the traditionary law of Moses. Their tradition, their paradosis. Huh? It's twisted. Nobody in the world was telling the truth when Jesus came. That's really a sobering thing, isn't it? The teachers in Israel, the men who were in charge, the men who were running the nation was the Pharisees, and they were the Babylonian rabbis. They didn't repent in Babylon. They came back, brought the synagogue with them, brought their halak on her Godal, brought it back over to Israel during the days of Jesus, and they were corrupting, and that's why Jesus fought them every day. You cannot understand, you can't understand the Gospels fully unless you understand the Halakha and the Haggadah and what Jesus was saying to them. There's no way you can understand it. I've got some things in this book. Let's see if here, maybe I can read a couple of things. Let me, let me go over here to Luke 6. I'm going to show you something. Now, everything in the halakha, they didn't twist. You understand what I'm saying? Jesus would accept the halakha that was right when they implemented the washing of water into their proselyte process. Before Jesus was nailed to the cross, the washing in water wasn't nailed until he was, was not done away with till he was nailed to the cross. All rituals were nailed to the cross with him, blotting out the handwriting of rituals. But before then, when he was still alive, they incorporated, only when he dies is the rituals done away with, right? That's right. So they incorporated the washing, the circumcision, washing in water, and two turtle doves, and that was the process of bringing a proselyte to Israel. It was a naturalization process. Well, all males in Israel had to be circumcised and all of them had to offer two turtle doves. When Jesus, when Jesus comes to John the Baptist, the washing in water hadn't been blotted out. So he says, you can wash me in water, John. And they said in their halakha that if a man was from another nation, he was a Gentile, they would have to listen to him. Well, since Jesus was born in, in Bethlehem, but he was raised in Nazareth, that was in northern Israel, and they kept calling him a Samaritan, so he's telling John, they're going to have to listen to me since if you wash me in water by their halakha, they say they have to listen to a man who goes through this process. The only thing Jesus was lacking was the washing in water. When Jesus says, let's fulfill all righteousness, he's saying, let's fulfill the righteousness of their halakha and they will be compelled to hear me. He's not going to prove to them he's born in Bethlehem in southern Judah. He's not going to prove that. He's going to say, we'll use their own law against them. Then when he opens his mouth, they have to listen. John said, therefore am I come baptizing in water that Christ might be made manifest to Israel. That's why in John the first chapter. Now, let me just read this to you out of Luke. Now this is something Jesus is not even going to disagree with. He would agree with the halakha where it applied. And he would hammer them where they were lying. You know what that is? That's a mixed religion. Some truth and some lie. Now, look over here in Luke. Sixth chapter. Verse 38. This has an exact meaning. And this is in their halakha 
So they just simply put it down. It's in their tradition. It's in their, it's in their uh, customs, in their idioms. And they would put their idioms in the halakha. And Jesus is not complaining about that. Here in verse 38. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the, with the same measure that ye meet, or ye measure out, with all, it will be measured to you again. He's not talking about money here. He's talking about spiritual things. Let me read this to you out of the volume 3, which is the Luke volume. He says, Concerning measures heap up and stricken off, all this is halakhic terminology. Rabbi Mir, see there they are, Right into it, it says, R. Mir. When you see that, it's a reference. Has anybody read any out of your McClinic and Strong, you know, say, R. Mir, R. So-and-so says. That's usually out of their traditionary laws. Rabbi Mir saith, it is said, a tenth, a tenth to every lamb, whence is hinted that there were decimaries or tithing measures in the temple, one heaped up, the other stricken off, the heaped up was that by which they measured all their bread corn for holy uses. That which was stricken off was that whereby they measured the cakes or the high priest loaves. All the measures in the temple were heaped up besides that of the high priest. Now the gloss giving the reason why this was not heaped up as well as the other tells, it was because he was to divide the flour into two tents. If therefore the measure was heaped up, some of the fine flour would spill upon the ground as he moved it this way and that in dividing it. What he's talking about, they would, if they were giving you a basket or a container full of something, they would do it like so. They would, here you'd heap it up and lest it fall off like that when you heap something up, they would take a, a, a cup and level it up so you don't fall down. So it wouldn't be running off the side and it'd have a, like a little place in the top of it. That's, that's pressed down, heaped up, pressed down, uh, running over with men giving your bosom. And it's not talking about literal things. Let me give you something else. that they, There's so many things in here. Uh, You remember binding and loosing? That was in, that Jesus even used that against them. Bind, this was a rabbinical halakha from Babylon. When Jesus said, what have you bind on earth be bound in heaven? What have you loose on earth to be loosed in heaven? The law of binding and loosing was a rabbinical term from Babylon. Bind, D-O, loose, luo. Bind means to, to forbid, to declare guilty, or it means it means to. Uh, it's the opposite of loose, luo, meaning to permit, permit, or to pronounce innocent. It means to judge righteously. And it was, a, it was a Babylonian rabbinical term where some would come into the synagogue, they'd be handed the book of the law, and they'd be told to bind it loose according to the book. What that meant, it didn't mean we're going to bind the devil in the beer joint like the Pentecostals. Ah, we're going to loose uh, uh, Jesus on a massage parlor. Whoa! I'm sorry, that's idiocy. They were handed the book of the law and told to declare to declare guilty or innocent, guilty or innocent according to the word of God. That's what it meant. And not according to this halakha. So Jesus used that saying, it was a halakhic saying, and he used that to say, by the loose according to the book. Now, I love that this is my Matthew volume here. Boy, it's got a lot of stuff in it. Wait a minute, I didn't finish up what I was going to read to you. 
Commentary on the New Testament from the Talmud and Hebraic. Just excellent set of books. Excellent. But you have to know what I'm putting on the board for. You can even understand it. Let me see here. In fact, let me give you something else they said in their halakha. Here's something they said in their halakha. When a certain person being interrogated about certain conditions could give no answer, the standards by said, perhaps he is not skilled in the traditional doctrine in the halakha. But he may be able to expound. So they propound in Daniel 10, 21 to explain. To which that also agrees well, the masters of the Haggadah are expositions because they are darshanin or profound. Darshanin means they are profound searchers of the scriptures. Ooh wee. They call themselves Darshanon. D A R S H A N I N. Let me write this on the board. Here's another slap in their face. D A R S H A N I N. Darshanon means searchers of the scriptures. When Jesus looked at the Pharisees there in John 5, 39 and said, search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. That was like going, so slapping them right across the mouth. <laughs> They're going, we are the searchers of the scriptures. <laughs> Everything he said to them when he condemned them was halakha. They wanted to kill him for saying you call us, you tell us to search the scriptures. We are the searchers. That's what that darshanon means. Everything Jesus said to the Pharisees was an attack on them. He didn't put up with them. He went after them. And on the Sabbath day, they discussed discussions searching the scriptures. Goodness. They were so strangely bewitched that they valued nothing more than a skill in tickling or rubbing the itching ears of their auditors with such trifles. And over there in Second Timothy, the fourth chapter, men will be seeking after themselves having with itching ears. They'll be seeking teachers having itching ears. That was an attack by Paul when he wrote to Timothy on the Pharisees. Paul attacked the Pharisees all the time. These guys were something else. Let's see if I got anything else in here. I've got all kinds of things. I can't get to all these things. It's just so much. Let me do this. Let me, let me give you something about See, Talmud is all about this. Now, I've got the Talmud. It's a 22-volume set, 22 volumes. And let me read something to you about the Talmud. Let me see if i got my paper here. This comes out of the first volume of the Talmud. I made a printout here. I'm just going to read a little bit to you. What is the Talmud? The Talmud consists of a law code which is a traditionary law code, and a commentary on that code. The code is called Mishnah. That's in one volume. I've got that at home. I'm meant to bring it tonight. That's called Mishnah. Now, the Talmud, you had a Babylonian Talmud, and you had a Jerusalem Talmud. The Babylonian Talmud took precedence over the Jerusalem Talmud because it was a Babylonian synagogue Talmud and they said that was more righteous than the Talmud or the temple in Jerusalem. As I said earlier, the reason Paul went to the synagogue on Saturday was to attack the Pharisees. He didn't worship with them on Saturday when he'd go to synagogue. He'd preach to them and they'd run him out of town. When he went up here to 
when he went up here on his first missionary journey, went over to Cyprus, comes up here on the, uh, the southern corner of what we call Turkey or Pamphylia right here, he goes up to Antioch to the synagogue. He preaches Christ. They run him out of town because he's correcting their halakha and their agata. He goes over to Iconium. These guys are so mad in Antioch in that 13th chapter that they come over to Iconium the next week, stir up those people and run him out of town. There he goes down to Lystra. At Lystra, they're a bunch of idol worshipers and they say, oh, this is a god. This Paul is a god. They say, he is, he is uh, Hermes, the great interpreter of the gods, and Barnabas, his partner, is Jupiter. He said, we're not gods. So these people come down from the Iconium synagogue. They come down to Lystra, stir the people up to take Paul outside of the city and stone him and leave him for dead all because he's correcting their halakha. Every time the Bible will say when Jesus would say to the Pharisees, but you say, what he's doing is referring to their halakha, their twisted word of God. That's going on in America. Accept Christ is halakha. It's founded on nothing. Christmas is halakha. Sinner's prayer is halakha. It's not true. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Not pray a prayer. Somebody started preaching that and they just accepted it. And accept Christ is halakha. It's Roman Catholicism. It's walking the aisle and accepting the Eucharist, which they say Jesus is present in the Eucharist. So he says, the code is the Mishnah, a systematic exposition of 60 topics. They said they had to explain all of the Word of God because men couldn't explain it to himself. And is held by Judaism to record the originally oral part of the Torah that was revealed by Moses, by God to Moses at Mount Sinai. Now they're going to say that in the Talmud and Jesus is going to call these guys a liar. They're going to say it was explained to Moses on Mount Sinai and Jesus says, that's a lie. I did, it, there's no such thing. I didn't give that to Moses in the form of a verbal law. It was written on tables of stone. Boy, America's polluted with Halakha and Haggadah, aren't they? And it's held by Judaism to record the originally oral part of the Torah that was revealed by God to Moses on Mount Sinai. And Jesus said, that's a lie. The commentary is called Gemara. The commentary of the Talmud. G-E-M-A-R-A. -E That's another name. It's the commentary on the Talmud. It's another name for the Talmud. The commentary is called Gemara. Somewhat confusingly, simply the Talmud in 600 Christian era. The Gemara or Talmud is organized around laws of the Mishnah and also contains compositions devoted to Scripture's law and theology which explain and amplify the passages of the written part of Torah of Sinai, that's the Haggadah, known by the Christianity as the Old Testament. And they've twisted that. Thus, the Mishnah plus the Gemara equals the Talmud. Simply stated, the Mishnah presents laws and is about life, while the Gamera analyzes laws and is about the Mishnah. The Gamera's analytical argumentative commentary on the Mishnah's law, this is the Pharisees saying, as the rabbis of the Babylonian synagogue, we're the only people capable of interpreting what these things mean. Oh, sounds like a bunch of Southern Baptist preachers in the Southern Baptist Convention. We're the only ones that's capable of interpreting what the Bible means. That's exactly what they say. I'll ask my preacher. He's the only one interpreting what the he's the only one capable of interpreting what the Bible means. I I'm so stupid I can't think for myself. I'll ask my mom and dad if you're telling the truth, Jim Brown. I've told, I've told young people when I give them a tape, I said, DVD, you better not ask your mom and dad. They'll tell you that this is wrong because their preacher don't preach it. The Gammer's analytical arg argumentative commentary on the mission is laws emphasizes applied reason and practical logic. 
when you read something, don't believe it. This is commentary on the Talmud. The writers of the Talmud say, all of this is applied to reason and practical logic. Is it? No. Jesus said, no. It explains the regular and routine rules of conduct and conviction according to the rabbis of the Babylonian synagogue and Jesus beat them up under the title Pharisees and harmonizes cases where different laws seem to conflict in principle. In other words, they're explaining it according to whatever fits their lifestyle and they can get by what they want. Its discussions cover the protracted age from Moses at Sinai to the 7th century of the Common Era, thus drawing on nearly two millennia of Judaic culture lived out both in the land of Israel and Babylon, and all that's a lie. It's exposition of law and theology. It's not law, it's traditionary law. You see, you can't believe the Talmud at all. And this is the first volume of the Talmud. That's where this comes from. I'm reading from the first volume of the Talmud. Uh, thus drawing an, on nearly two millennia of the Judaic culture. Not Judaic culture. The Judaic traditionary law by the rabbis of the Babylonian synagogue. Lived out both in the land of Israel and in Babylonia. Its exposition of law and theology through cumulative over time forms a systematic account of the norms of behavior and belief set forth in one brief span of time at Sinai in order to pray, portray the timeless word of reason and order. And it's exactly opposite. It's unreasonable and disorder. What else do you expect the Talmud to say? Let me read something to you. If you've got a McClinic and Strong, look up Talmud, Mishnah, look up Midrash, Gamera, let me read some things to you. This is all on the Talmud out of McClinic and Strong right here. And these rabbis said these things. Very interesting. Talmud means doctrine or teaching. To teach the Talmud, that wonderful monument of human industry, human wisdom, and human folly. I like that. <laughs> that's, that's the writer of the McClinic and Strong. That's funny, isn't it? And human folly is the work which embodies the canonical and civil laws of the Jews. It consists of a Mishnah as text and voluminous collections of commentaries and illustrations called in the more modern Hebrew, Horaah, and in the Aramaic, Gemara. The com complement and completion to make perfect. History and composition. The Jews divided their law into written and unwritten. Halak on Hagada. The former contained Pentateuch, and may I add, twisted Pentateuch. Some Jews have assigned the same antiquity to both, alleging that Moses received them on Mount Sinai. That's what I just said a while ago. And that Jesus received and that Joshua received the oral law from Moses. And Jesus is saying, you've heard it, it hath been said, but it's a lie. He corrects all this in Matthew, the fifth chapter. Hath been said is a reference to the halakha, the, the oral tradition. And you hear me stand up here and say, you've heard it, it hath been said that Christmas is the birthday of Jesus and Christmas is Christ's mass, and it's a lie. I'm saying the same thing about what's going on in America today. I say, you've heard that it hath been said by the Baptists that you have to accept Christ, and that's a, lie. that's a lie. But God said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You can take all these traditions in America and apply them the same way they're applied here. And remember, all this resulted from Israel being scattered. It's amazing, isn't it? And that Joshua received the oral law from Moses who transmitted it to the 70 elders, and that's a lie, Jesus said. These again transmitted to the men of the great synagogue. Ha ah, ha! Oh yeah! <laughs> I just good grief! They say insane things, and Jesus said, "They said in the great synagogue, I didn't say that." How are you going to understand? Gosh, and we're just getting started in this. We we 
we can go all through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, even in Paul's writings, and see the halak on the Haggadah all referred to. When Paul said, I was more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers when I murdered the Christians. Tradition is the word paradosis. It's there in Galatians, the first chapter. He said, I was zealous of this lie. I killed people for it. I killed Christians for it. And he goes on to say, it was transmitted to men of the great synagogue, the last of whom was Simon the Just. I started to put his name up there a while ago, Simon the Just. He was the last great rabbi of the great synagogue. He goes on. Had one had a man named Judah the Holy, uh, who embodied the celebrated code of tradition, law, or Mishnah, all the authorized interpretations of the Mosaic Law. From Moses our teacher to our holy rabbi, and one no one has united in a single body of doctrine what publicly was taught as the oral law. Goes on down here, talks about the system of interpretation which they exemplify and embody existed in the age of the so-called sulfurum or the scribes. The scribes were the doctors of the law. They were high-rolling Pharisees, rabbis. They were top of the class who took the place of the prophets, the men of the great synagogue. And Jesus told the scribes and Pharisees, you built the sepulchers of the prophets. They said, we'll kill you. They did. The men of the great synagogue promoted it. It prevailed from the Hasmonean period, which is around 166 B.C. on. That was Judas Maccabeus and his brothers and his father. Period till that of Hadrian, about 300 years. The Midrash was naturally simple at first, but it grew more comprehensive and complicated under a variety of influences of which controversy was the least powerful. When, when secret meanings, hidden wisdom, deep knowledge were sought in the letter of Scripture, they were hunting for this. That's what the rabbis were hunting for, secret meanings. The Midrash shaped themselves accordingly, and a distinction in their contents could be made. Thus, they have been divided into the Halakha, the rule, and Haggadah, what is said. Now, let me read some of the things that they say. Insane stuff. Huh. Let me skip that. I'll read that later. Let me see here. All right. I've got so much stuff. I'm trying to read you the... All right. Rabbi, it says R, Yohanan, J-O-C-H-A-N-A-N says, here's what he says. He's one of the rabbis of the Babylon synagogue. He says, how is it proved that the Holy One, blessed be he, they always add that to it, blessed be he, does pray? How does God pray? It's crazy what they did. Prayer means to bow to the will of God. What does God do? Say, I bow to my will of myself. From Isaiah 57 and 7, I will bring them into my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. So they say, since he said my house of prayer, that's where God goes into his house and prays. The house of prayer was the temple where the people went in to pray, not God. It's kind of like Jesus on the cross. What was he saying? Myself, myself, why have I forsaken me? Mark it, it is not said their prayer, but my prayer. Therefore, it is conclusively proved that Jesus, that God prays. Prayer means to bow to the will of God. That's insane, and that's in, their, that's in the writings of the Talmud. Then they said, God is represented as needing a sacrifice to atone for himself and his sins. That's in this halakha on Haggadah. Rabbi Simeon, the son of Pazi, asked, It is written, God made two great lights, and again, the greater light and the lesser light. How does this agree? It, you talk about wrenching, they're going, 
How does it agree to make a greater light and a lesser light? Answer, the moon said to the Holy One. The moon talks to God. Blessed be he. Lord of the universe, is it possible for two kings to use one crown? He said to her, go and make thyself smaller. It's God talking to the moon. She said to him again, Lord of the universe, because I spoke to thee, reasonably should I make myself smaller? And God said, in order to comfort her, go and rule day and night. She said to him, what advantage will this be to me? This is the moon and God talking in the Talmud or Halakha. Oh God, oh. These guys are nuts. You know what? She said to him, What advantage will this be to me? Of what use is the candle in the middle of the day? He replied, Go and let Israel number the days of the years by thee. She said, It is impossible even for the sun that the calendar should be reckoned after him only, for it is written, Let them be signs and seasons for days and years. And God said to the moon, Go, and, and the righteous shall be called by thy name, such as Jacob the little, Samuel the little, David the little, I guess little John too, huh? Robin Hood's friend. And when God saw that the moon was not quite comforted with these promises, he said, Bring ye a sacrifice and atone for me because I lessened the size of the moon. God's sin needs to be atoned for according to the Talmud. That's trash, isn't it? Talk about garbage. All right, let me read something else. God's occupation. God needs an occupation. On one occasion, Abiathon found Elijah and asked him, What does the Blessed One what does the Holy One, blessed be he, do? Remember, the Holy One is Jesus, isn't it? He answered, he is studying the case of the concubine of Gibeah. We do not give the excerpt in full. And what is the opinion, what is God's opinion about this concubine? He says that Abiathon, my son, is right. And Jonathan, my son, is right. Is there then a doubt in heaven about it? They're both right, and they both have a different opinion. Sounds like Baptists in Church of Christ. We all believe in Jesus, and we all go to heaven, but the Church of Christ thinks the Baptists are going to hell, and the Baptists think the Church of Christ is going to hell. Then he goes on, Rabbi, the son of Shelah, met Elijah and asked him, What does the Holy One, blessed be he, do? Elijah replied, He recites the lesson he hears from the lips of the rabbis, God learns his lessons from the rabbis. The rabbis have to teach God. This is the same people who Jesus is referring to. You've heard that it hath been said. But I say, it's idiocy. He goes on in that. Oh, me. Let me see here. He talks about the Bath Coal here. Bath Coal. I've got it, I started to read it a while ago. Both coal was a, was a message from heaven. And the message of both coal was, if you heard that, if you heard a word, if you heard the word, uh, uh, Jacob died in the Old Testament. This, oh, Jacob died. Oh, I know a man named Jacob. He must be dead. This is a sign from heaven. I saw a bird fly. And land on this tree. And that's God has a sign. And I asked God to let me see a bird lie, landing on a tree if he wanted me to go to Florida and take this church. I prayed that God that the sun would come up somewhere in the world tomorrow if he wanted me to do this. And they call that laying out a fleece. And they read the skies and Pentecostals and Charismatics and even some Baptists say, I saw a sign. I heard a word of God from heaven. That was called a both coal. Peter attacks that over in, in 2 Peter, the first chapter. He's talking about 2 Peter. He refers what the Pharisees are saying in 2 Peter. 2 Peter, first chapter. Even when God, well, let me read this and then I'll comment to you on this. In verse 17. For he received from God the Father honor and glory 
when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory or from heaven. When God said about Jesus, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, that was according to the Pharisees, the way they looked at things, and there were Pharisees there when Jesus was baptized and there was a voice from heaven that to them that would have been a bath coal, but they rejected Jesus. And he says, such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And this voice came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. So that is a reference to bath coal, B O. B-A-T-H-K-O-L. Bothko. Let me read some more of this. This is outrageous. What Jesus was saying to him, he's saying, you are outrageous. Now, here's what they said about paradise and Gehenna, or what we would refer to as hell, which is the Valley of Hinnom. Of the former description are all the extravagancies relating to to the extent of paradise, the dimensions of Gehenna, the size of Leviathan, and the shore harbor, the freaks of Ashmodal, they measured everything and put it down in their halakha and in their tom and said, here's how long a Leviathan is. Here's the dimensions of hell. Here's the dimensions of heaven. And then he says, I admit also that there are many and various contradictions in the Talmud and indeed it would be a miracle if there were none, the writer here says. He says, like all other productions of unaided humanity, it is not free from mistakes and prejudices to remind us that the writers were fallible men. Let me read this to you here. We heartily wish that some of the rabbins who wrote the Talmud had been content with the discharging that which may be considered a duty and not laid upon, not laid themselves open to the charge justly brought against them. The charge justly brought against them, the writer here says, doing injury to the morals and minds of those who study their writings. And that's doing injury to those who... You, you study, you study the, the Talmud or you study anything from the Talmud and you're doing injury to the people. He goes in and talks... The writer here says, there are, is there any proper excuse for writing or printing 178 folio pages in order to define all the forms in which imagination can suggest that only one of these crimes could be committed, let us, as the subject is import, important, for a moment consider a parallel case, murder is forbidden. And they would write pages and pages on how you could murder somebody. They left out machine guns because they didn't have any back then. They left out pistols because they didn't have any back then. They left out uh, uh, ray guns or, or some kind of a ray, some kind of a that we have in our space technology, the, the, the things they're saying. And he goes on to listen to this. Unquestionably, the reasonings of Paul and writings of the other apostles greatly affected the whole tone of thought and manner of expression which prevailed among those who nevertheless refused to acknowledge their own Messiah. He's talking about the rabbis. This is a common mistake among even learning, learned Jews, because some parts of the Talmud are unquestionably very ancient. They speak of the whole as a work of very great antiquity. They cannot altogether divest themselves of the fabulous notion that God gave the oral as well as the written law to Moses himself. They can't divest themselves from that, and it's not true. Thus they habitually claim for the Talmud as antiquity a degree of respect to which it is by no means entitled. The Jews give it a respect in it. It's not entitled to it like he says. i got to read this to you. This is interesting. What he has to say about it. This is something that they would say in the Talmud or in the Halakha Haggadah. 
The wise men have informed us that when the teacher entered the house of learning, the teacher would be one of the sages, one of the rabbis, one of the Pharisees. He said, May it please thee, O Lord my God, that I may not be the cause of any offense nor err in anything as regards the halakha. Lord, may I not be the cause of any offense concerning lies that my companions may rejoice over me and that I may not say of things unclean that are clean and things clean that are unclean and that my companions may not err in anything as regards halakha and that I may rejoice over them. And when the teacher left the house of learning, he said, this is what they would say, I thank thee, O God, that thou hast given me my portion among those who sit in the house of learning and not among those who sit at the corners of the streets doing menial tasks. I thank thee, O oh God, that I'm not other men are. Why do you think he said that? Now let me read this to you. The Talmud or doctrinal as the whole is called was the work of nearly 500 years. Here then, we find a prodigious mass of contradictory opinions and infinite number of caustical cases, a logic of scholastic theology, some recondite wisdom and such rambling dotage. And he goes, many perils, many puerile tales in oriental fancies, ethics in sophisms and so forth. And I like, this is one of my favorite parts. The Talmud is a book which seems in some parts entirely devoid of common sense and in others filled with deep meaning, abounding with absurd subtilities and legal finesse full of foolish tales and wild imaginations, but also containing aphorisms and parables which except in their lack of simple and sublime character of holy writ resemble in a degree the parables and sentences of the New Testament. They resemble in a degree. The Talmud is an immense heap of rubbish. I like that statement. That's what Jesus was fighting. At the bottom, which is a few bright pearls of Eastern wisdom are to be found. No book has ever expressed more faithfully the spirit of its authors, this we notice the more when we compare the Talmud with the Bible. The Bible, that book of books given to and by means of the Israel of God, the Talmud, the book compassed by Israel without their God in the time of their dispersion, their misery, and their degeneracy. Well, he didn't have many good things to say about it, these writers of this. Anything more utterly unhistorical than the Talmud cannot be conceived. It is probable that no human writings ever confounded names, dates, and facts with more absolute indifference. And then he goes on and he tells, I'll just read this, I'm about out of time. He tells in here all the ways that you can defile the Sabbath. Sabbath breaking. Here's the ways you can defile it. To sow, to plow, to mow, to gather into sheaves, to thresh, to winnow, to sort corn, to grind, to sieve, to knead, to bake, to shear. This is all in the Talmud and the Halakha. To shear wool, to wash wool, to card, to dye, to spin, to warp, to shoot two threads, to weave two threads, to cut and tie two threads because you're using both hands. They're saying that's work. One hand is not work. To tear two threads with intent to sew to catch game, to slaughter, to skin, to salt to hide, to singe, to tan, to cut up a skin, to write two letters, to erase two letters with intent to write, to build, to demolish, to extinguish fire, to kindle fire, to strike with a hammer, to carry out, number 39, to carry out of one property to another. And in it, he says it treats of the difference between the schools of Halil and Shammai. He said there's 39 kinds of forbidden work on the Sabbath Rule and measure for things, the carrying of which makes liable to a sin offering. And how about, how about flying an airplane on the Sabbath? How about driving a car? How about 
it's like they got it all back then, right? That's what Jesus was fighting back in Matthew for the fifth chapter when he says, you have heard that it had been said by the scribes and Pharisees in the entire Gospels he's fighting this. I'm fighting the preachers in America for their twisting the word of God for their halakha and their haggadah. They read the Bible, twist it the way they want to, just like the Pharisees took it to Babylon and twist it the way they want to. It's just ungodly what they did. And he said it several times there in Matthew 5. And he speaks, notice he says, unless your righteousness exceeds the, scribe, reach, exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, which were the rabbis of the Babylonian synagogue, you'll not enter the kingdom of heaven. Then he says, you've heard it, it hath been said, reverencing the old law, but I say, he says that in verse 21. He says that in verse 27. You have heard it hath been said by them of old time. Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say that if you look upon a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery in your heart and it doesn't even have to be a married woman. Whew. What Jesus is doing is beating their brains out and he starts. He's up here in Galilee. He preaches his first message in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. That's called the Sermon on the Mount. It's Luke 6 in Luke. There's more in Matthew 7 than Luke 6. And he's preaching the Sermon on the Mount and he's attacking the Pharisees. That's how he starts his ministry. He's up here. He's up here in Galilee. Somewhere up here in Galilee, an area. Here's the Sea of Galilee. He's up here preaching to these blessed ones, these poor in spirit, these meek, and he's attacking the Pharisees. It's amazing to me how twisted the world is with their doctrines. America, the Baptists are twisted. The Church of Christ, the Charismatics, the Pentecostals, they're all perverted. They all have a halakha and a haggadah. Christmas is halakha. Easter is halakha. Accept Christ is halakha. Sinner's prayer is halakha. It's all verbal law. It's all a tradition. A tradition is passed down by word of mouth from one generation to the next and has no foundation in truth. That's what it is. We are, and he says in, and I'm going to cover this in verse 31, you have heard that it hath been said, whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a separation. It doesn't say bill of divorce. They said just if you want to divorce your wife, separate from her, kick her out of the house and say, I divorce you, get out. Jesus says, no, you have to give them a bill of divorce for the divorce to be proper. It says that in the 24th chapter of Deuteronomy. So they took that and twisted it. They said, if you found a woman that you liked better than your wife and she was prettier, all you had to do was go home and say, wife, get out, I divorce you. Jesus said, it's not a divorce unless you give her a writing of divorce and split all the proceeds half and half. Then it's a divorce, he said, and then it's legal in the eyes of God. He corrects them all through here, and I'm going to come back and hit some of these. Just amazes me how corrupt America is. That's what they were following in the first century when Jesus was born. They were following all of this Pharisee, rabbinical Judaism from Babylon. The synagogue is not any different than the Southern Baptist Convention or the Methodist Church or any of these other churches. They're all the same. They're twisted and perverted. Am I out of time? Boy, we are... I said it this morning. All America's got left is to fall. Every time... Men would make themselves a name. Did they make themselves a name, an authority? Yes, yes they did. The Pharisees did. Name means authority. Onoma. Shem in the Hebrew. They made up their own doctrine. They simply twisted the word of God just like Satan did in the garden. Did God say what well, he didn't mean that? Here's what he meant. Whew. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. God, sometimes I get so frustrated at the preacher's I pray you'll come soon. And in the meantime, Lord, I pray you'll strengthen the flock. Cause them to pay real close attention to the Word of God so they can see this mess that we're in. They can be strengthened knowing that you're going to come one day. We have to live for you. 
If we're ever going to live for you, it needs to be now. Because, Lord, you're going to scatter this nation with a great famine and destruction that's coming. Deal with our hearts, Lord. Lead us to elect. Open up many doors for the ministry. We'll give you praise for everything in Christ's name. Amen.